My name is Terry Shillington, and I'm honored to be your moderator this afternoon. <clears throat> Um, and uh, to, uh, we just have two or three announcements here. If you have cell phones, would you mind putting them on mute for the session? Uh, we acknowledge that our events take place on the lands of the Blackfoot people <coughs> and Métis Nations of Alberta Region 3 and pay respect to their past, present, and future cultural heritage beliefs and relationship to the land. <coughs> we commit to do our utmost to assist uh, with efforts to mend and heal past and present injustices. <clears throat> um, we just remind you, if you're, you may be new to SACPA, that um, uh, you, we encourage people to have memberships, and that costs $30, and you can find Lori, who's uh, wandering around here someplace. <laughs> you ask afterwards. Um, uh, and there's also a suggestion box at the back where we welcome <clears throat> your ideas about future topics. So uh, we'll, uh, fo we'll follow uh, Mike's presentation with uh, Q&A and uh, intend to be finished at 1 and we need to do that because somebody else I think wants to be in here at 1. So we're, uh, we're guests in the big facility here. Our speaker today is Mike Fox and uh, he's speaking on, on homelessness, a complex social issue. What is the impact of homelessness on encampment and city residents? What are the solutions? <clears throat> Not going to say a lot in terms of intro to Mike, except that he's the director of community services. He'll tell you more about that. But he's been here for a year and a half. And uh, would you join me in welcoming Mike Fox? <clears throat> okay, and hello, everybody. Um, it's great to see such a, a diverse crowd out here and uh, seeing people from all walks of life. It's, uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be able to. Um, come and discuss this important issue. Um, I also just want to thank you for uh, your land acknowledgement and uh, on the land that we live on here in Lethbridge. Uh, me and my family arrived here uh, about just over a year and a half ago and uh, we were pre pleasantly welcomed by everyone, all residents, everybody that lives in, in, uh, in Lethbridge and we've found that it's very different than other places that we lived in uh, across uh, all of Canada. Uh, one of the big things we've noticed is everyone is nice, um, it seems to be. Everybody is willing to talk to us and we really, really enjoyed being welcomed in that way. And uh, I, I really uh, um, appreciate how people uh, interact in, in Lethbridge and that you can talk to anybody. And when I say anybody, it is anyone. So I, I really thank you. We, we showed up in COVID and everybody knows that's a rough time. And uh, even during COVID, people would talk to you across the street or uh, come up and, and, and talk to us about important issues. So I, I really am thankful for being able to be in Lethbridge and serve the community. So homelessness, it is a very complex social issue. It's, uh, people are dealing with it across Canada, across the states and around the world. And what it really needs is a team approach. And when I say a team approach, it's not just government. It's not just uh, one agency. It's everyone. Everyone has to pay attention to the issue. Everyone needs to uh, be focused on how can we be a better community and how can we address these issues together. So I do want to state that there is a lot of different points of view and, and differences on, on the subject. Um, but one thing I always ask is, can people be respectful of others' point of views and how can we work together to uh, address them and get to the root issues? So at the city, there's, uh, there is a team and this topic affects every department at the city. And not only at the city, it, it affects lots of other organizations across the community. So when I'm speaking today, I'm coming from the lens of the community social development it's a small department at the City of Lethbridge. It tries to work with st stakeholders um, using provincial, federal, and local dollars to try and address uh, some of uh, the issues and complexities around uh, uh, the vulnerable population, homelessness, and other uh, types of uh, um, situations at the city. 
Um, so a lot of people don't understand actually what community social development does. The main thing we do is we coordinate, facilitate and convene. So we try to bring people together, different resources together and try and come up with a solution to the issue. Now I've only been here for a year and a half so I have to compliment the team that has been here for I guess about the past five years. They, uh, they've worked hard on trying to come up with a collective impact approach to this. Now in this uh, continuum, it's really a continuum of care and there's lots of facets and that could be a whole presentation on itself. So I'm going to try and skip highlight, hi highlights over this. Um, so affordable and social housing coordination is done through the city with lots of stakeholders and others that are involved in it. We address uh, community social issues and again, it, it takes a team to do that. Um, and then also we, uh, um, we uh, facilitate, coordinate and convene on requests from council and uh, from administration, from public concerns and comments. So I did mention the collective impact and collective impact is a, a new term when we're dealing with uh, issues. If you Google it, there's lots of different mind maps and everything else that talks about collective impact. But collective impact, uh, how the city has decided to create a collective impact is by creating um, different advisory groups um, and that started uh, a while ago um, where we have to through federal and provincial government we need to uh, have a CBO and that's uh, a community-based uh, organization that looks at the funding and makes sure that uh, they're in favor or in support of where the funding is going and currently the city is that CBO so we do meet with an advisory group now before I got here the advisory group created this uh, community well-being and social strategy and that strategy said let's work towards having um, a committee of sorts that has all the different st stakeholders uh, that deal with this uh, with all the social issues in Lethbridge uh, at one table so we can come up with good solutions to move forward um, many other municipalities across the country are also looking at that and if you want to see some of the municipalities we work with on uh, creating uh, different uh, types of committees uh, you can go on our website at uh, community social development uh, at the city of Lethbridge and there is a, a list of different items that we do there. So with the collective impact we do work closely with uh, Lethbridge Police Services and all of our uh, outreach services. If anybody is curious on them, I do have a list, but I don't want to uh, go into each service provider right now. I'm sure there'll be some questions around, around that as we move forward. Okay, I think that's the next one. Okay, uh, the funding models. Funding models uh, come from several different uh, pots of uh, money throughout the, to the city of Lethbridge. And uh, this is a list of them and they have different grant programs and I won't go into those all right now, they can be found on our website if you uh, go on there but there's different websites that look at different um, different social issues at different areas so there is the family community support uh, services so that's the FCSS outreach support um, service initiative which is the OSSI the OSSI is uh, and the FCSS are provincially funded and uh, the OSSI, the difference there is that is given to the City of Lethbridge at a minister's uh, discretion as a grant. So it can change who, who delivers that model through the OSSI. Reaching home is the federal dollars we get and uh, that also has a portion of the reaching home dollars that is for the indigenous community. So it has to go to uh, the, uh, through indigenous uh, le uh, lens and uh, outreach for the indigenous community. And then uh, the other part of uh, uh, money is at the City of Lethbridge. And uh, so at the City of Lethbridge, uh, it hasn't had a huge uh, amount of taxpayers' dollars in it. We've really relied on the other levels of government. However, this year, there is, uh, there is a, we're in a budget cycle, and there are several initiatives, uh, and, and I would encourage everyone to look at them. Um, what we are looking at there is uh, tax funding different parts um, of it, including some of the different outreach uh, to give more consistency uh, on the type of outreach that we do for the vulnerable sector. 
So uh, that, the, if it's a tax-funded dollars, we don't rely on other levels of government on how it's dictated and how, what the key performance indicators that we have to provide are. So if you do go on to uh, some of those, I have a list here of them. I'm not going to go through them all. But uh, they are, uh, most of them have been sponsored by uh, councillors. So you can outreach to your councillors if you're in support or against of any budget initiative. Now, one of the initiatives, it's uh, called C2. It's a fire hydrant drinking water fountain. So it would be a pilot project where we would set up uh, drinking water fountains on hydrants. So everybody would have access to uh, potable water. C5.1 uh, is a affordable and social housing operating grant. Um, that would go uh, into operating, uh, uh, subsidizing housing and um, different types like that. That's a little complex. It hasn't been developed. Really operating dollars for uh, municipal and affordable housing usually falls under the province. And uh, a lot of municipalities hesitate getting in there where it may cost a lot of money uh, for, for the municipality to get in there. Usually they uh, rely on capital grants and uh, the city does have a capital grant uh, uh, fund currently. And I believe it's sitting at just over five million currently to uh, be used for uh, capital initiatives um, for housing. And then there's also uh, there's uh, an increase for the capital grant in a different way. So on this, this initiative, what we're trying to do is pay for development uh, fees up front because a big barrier for people applying for, uh, for grants uh, or for housing is uh, the zoning requirements, the different public outreach. It costs a lot of money and you may not get the best return. So following the example of, of let's say Calgary, Calgary gives uh, developers $50,000 up front to help them do that outreach and the community stuff up front so the projects can move forward. C7.1 uh, is the fee assistant program. And this, uh, this one here, you might have heard it in the news lately. Uh, what happened is uh, council did put some funds into the fee assistant program aimed not just at recreation and culture, but at a transit initiative to help people uh, be able to get on transit. Uh, C72 uh, is a, a transit fare decrease. This is talking about uh, allowing seniors and people under 18 to ride transit for free. So that's an interesting one, um, and uh, Council will be debating that one too at budget time. And then C11.1 is crime prevention through environmental design. What that is, there's a, it's called a septage. Uh, the Lethbridge uh, Police Services will come to a property and help them design a property so it's less conducive for unwanted uh, activity. So that one is going forward too. And then there's also uh, money coming forward as C11-2 is outreach programs currently funded uh, from the OSSI dollars which is the provincial pot of money. Um, we're, we're suggesting or a councillor is bringing forward that it's municipally funded. And then there's uh, C11.3, uh, a lot of people have used, probably heard about it uh, um, the last four years. We've had money for uh, downtown safety and education program and uh, that, that was only one time funding. What we're trying to do is bring that into the base budget so it can be ongoing throughout, uh, throughout the years to come. C11.4 is the outreach diversion team. So these are the people that go out to different encampments or talk to people that are out uh, on the streets and uh, see if there's services that they can be provided, uh, if they can help in any way. And uh, they do that on a regular basis. And then the other one is the Clean Sweep program. Um, and the Clean Sweep program is uh, to go around and try and get uh, uh, rid of waste or uh, refuge that uh, is no longer uh, needed around an area. And they help clean up uh, and keep the city from having more uh, waste around. So those are the new initiatives that our council sponsored and they're gonna be coming forward and debated on, I believe it's November 8th. Uh, and then there's also a new initiative uh, from uh, staff that's bringing forward one that is about uh, the accessor ride uh, and demand services and increased funding for that as well. 
So all these initiatives are, can be found on the website and I would encourage anybody to take a look at all the initiatives. I believe there's quite a few there. So uh, please contact your councillors or uh, uh, come out and listen to the budget proce proceedings. It happens once every four years, so it's a good time to get involved. So the root cause of homelessness, um, I'm not an expert on this. I would never claim to be. Um, and again, but there, there's lots of perspectives out there. One, I'm not gonna go through the whole slide here. I'll let you read it for yourself. But the one thing I, I have to say on this is a lot of it is based around trauma, mental health, and different addictions. And one thing I like to say to everybody is we're all a paycheck away from being homeless. So let's have compassion. Let's have understanding, and let's try and understand how each individual um, got to where they are. What we have to do is meet individuals where they are and see how we can help them. There isn't a one-stop solution uh, for everyone. So in the current situation at the City of Lethbridge, uh, over the fa past four months, we have uh, developed a part on our website. We've had a lot of uh, public concern. Um, and again, this is from the increased uh, homelessness we're seeing in our community. And uh, people are struggling. So we have come up with uh, an encampment response uh, steps on how we deal with when there's an encampment there. So the city's uh, part on encampments are these steps. Um, a lot of people jump right to enforcement. Um, and I get a lot of questions about enforcement. The city actually doesn't enforce um, the actual um, items. What we do is we have to follow our bylaws that have been put out, and the enforcement part is actually Lethbridge Police Services uh, is, is who enacts the, the actual enforcement of that. So again, if there is any questions about any one of these steps, I am more than happy. There's a lot of information also on this on our website. So I would be happy to uh, talk about it. But really, the first step is we have to know where an encampment is. So people have to call in if they see one. What we do is then we send an outreach team and they go and talk with the people at the encampment, uh, see if there's services and touch base. We also do outreach. And then there's a notification if it's in an area where uh, the city has bylaws or doesn't allow it or other items like that. The one thing that we do try and prevent at the city and most municipalities across Canada do is an encampment getting entrenched. Once a encampment is entrenched, uh, some of the vulnerable are preyed on at those. There's an increase of illegal activity and uh, so there is a lot of times where those encampments have to be dispersed. And uh, again, there is no perfect solution. If the encampment is dispersed, especially in Lethbridge, we don't have enough shelter space. We don't have enough housing. So if, where, where are people gonna go? And that is a good question. And where they're gonna go is around the community in new locations or other locations. So again, there is no uh, perfect solution. The reason why encampments are uh, broken up is if there is an increase in, um, in illegal uh, activity or uh, there starts to become situations where it could be harmful to residents or people in the encampment. And then uh, step six, if an encampment does leave, we do clean up. Um, we also do try and visit encampments and uh, clean up uh, any, any unwanted uh, uh, belongings or, or waste around the encampment on a regular basis too. Now, back in uh, 2018, the pit count was about, sorry, I should say a point in time uh, count of homelessness. Now, what everybody has to understand is this is a point in time. It's, we don't have information on a daily basis of how many people are living uh, on, on the streets. So this is a point in time count. Now, in 2018, there was 223, uh, roughly, uh, people living unhoused. And now we're, you know, the report will be coming out in the first couple of weeks of November and be made public, but it's looking like it's going to be over 400 now in the city of Lethbridge. Now this is not unlike other municipalities across Canada. Most are seeing from about a 35 to a 70 percent increase in homelessness, and that's for various reasons. Um, so that, that is the point in time count. We just did that in September with several of our service providers. 
So another question I get calls daily on is whose responsibility are different items when it comes to social um, issues in a community? So we do have this on our website. We have put it out on Twitter, Facebook, a lot of different places. We do have hard copies that we can hand out as well, just not here today, but uh, we do have uh, different copies there. But it lays out what the different responsibilities are. So under the city of Lethbridge, we do have an advocacy plan. So we do advocate to the other levels of government, the provincial and, and federal government. Um, a big one is zoning to allow for uh, social services. And uh, there is also an initiative that I forgot to mention, I didn't have it written down, but uh, is to have somebody to work on our zoning uh, and make it more inclusive. So we can have, uh, uh, what the province and feds always say to us, is if the municipality paves the way, you will get housing, you will get the services. So one way of doing that is making uh, zoning and land use more inclusive. So we do have an uh, initiative going forward with that to try and uh, allow those types of developments to happen uh, more easily. We also deal with community cleanliness. Uh, cleanliness. So this is uh, putting out garbages. You'll see uh, um, dog bags that are provided uh, generally around the community. We do. Uh, we work with the province to do needle uh, uh, cleanups uh, and different. Just in any general parks we, and stuff, we do with the solid waste aspects of that. And then we support co coordinated social service and social service providers. And again, this is where CSD coordinate, facilitates, and convenes. We actually don't have operational staff at the city in community social development. What we do is we hire other service providers that are more in, in the know or work with uh, the vulnerable population to understand the needs, and we try and keep up updated on that. And then also what we do is we do uh, bylaw de development and approval. And usually this can be at the request of residents, council, uh, we'll look at the bylaws and we'll, we'll, we'll update them. We do check across Canada on how different bylaws are going and uh, we work with uh, different agencies to make sure that we have the right bylaws to deal with issues facing the community and how the community wants to move forward with those. So that's a quick one. The provincial government, uh, is uh, the, their mandate is mental health. Uh, public health, addictions, and also affordable housing, homeless supports, crisis supports, uh, supports for social organizations, and employment, and then also law and justice. So you can see a lot of them are for advocacy from a municipality. Now, a lot of people say, what is the city, city done? Um, and I can only to speak about the time since I've been here, and I really have to thank uh, there was uh, two groups that were formed. One was the Social Service Integration Group. You might have heard it as the SSIG group. They came together and did a lot of community work, a lot of hours put in, and brought forward recommendations for administration and council to take action on. So I really have to thank them for the time they put in. There was also the Clean and Safe group. That was another group of uh, residents that came forward to, uh, to uh, form a plan, look at things, and bring forward uh, recommendations. And then also the advisory committee. So as of, uh, I believe it was September, there was a motion to move forward with a committee uh, type, um, uh, a new committee structure, and that was turned down by council. So we are reconvening, and we're gonna probably change how the advisory groups works a little bit to include those other two groups and facets of it, so we can continue to look at the issues and bring forward good recommendations to council. <laughs> Um, some of the, the other things that we've done is we have enhanced the clean sweep program, we've enhanced the diversion outreach team, and uh, City Council did allocate uh, in September this year uh, $230,000 to uh, enhance these services. And some of it was for enhanced enforcement. So I know I saw this uh, handout all, all around uh, the room, and uh, it does talk about what can you do. And what numbers do I call? Those are a lot of common questions I get. So on the forums around the room, you'll see different things that how you can help and who you call and some of the links uh, to, to the city services. And for additional resources, please go to uh, lethbridge.ca at CSD. And on there, you'll see about six or seven links below um, that has all the information I'm talking about and further detail. Oh, it jumped forward there. 
So thank you, I know that I'm uh, just about out of time, but one thing I do wanna say is I may be part of the, uh, I'm, I'm trying to work on, on this at the city for the best uh, interest of the community, but uh, I'm just the, the front facing. There is a big team behind me at the city, and I wanna thank for them for all the help that they uh, provide me to try and answer some of the questions today. And again, I really look forward to the, the community discussion now, and I look forward to trying to answer some of the questions that come forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. A couple of announcements before we get into, um, into the cut and thrust of the debate here. Um, <clears throat> thanks to the LSCO for their free offering of this space. In return, they hope that you'll patronize the cafeteria, and I see a number of you have. So, thank you. Uh, if you want to be a member of LSCO, by the way, there's a $50 membership, and they'd, they'd welcome you. Thanks to the University of Lethbridge for their ongoing support for SACPA. Thanks to Shaw TV and Bridge City TV for recording our sessions. And you can watch SACPA on Shaw Spotlight TV. <clears throat> um, we have a couple of interesting topics coming up in the next two weeks. Uh, next week is not unrelated to this. Shenla is a co community coalition, social health equity network of Lethbridge and area, and they're calling for collective action to address child and family poverty in Lethbridge and area, and Sharon Yannicke will be speaking from that coalition. Two weeks from today, uh, Trevor Harrison will be speaking on how, how uh, Daniel Smith became UCP leader and what it means for Alberta. So look, look forward to both those. So we turn to the question and answer period, and uh, uh, as you I hope that uh, people will line up along this wall and uh, come and ask a question. We ask you to be brief in your question, and then go and sit down and uh, receive the uh, speaker's comments from your chair. So uh, do we have a questioner? Um, uh, I, I actually have a we, we want you to come to the mic if you have a question. I, I actually, I have a statement. Just, just wait, till, wait till you get to the mic. I actually have, I have a statement I'd like to make. Is everyone okay listening to this? Brief. Uh, it is brief. I can speak fast, but I, it, I am, I am, a, I am a here as a supporter for, for the individuals that were living in Tent City, as we are, we are in the, or the encampments, as we're all known. Okay, I, I, I have a home. Okay, I live in a home. I, I, I was I was not part of the I was not part of the tents. Okay, but those were my friends. Those were those are those were people's homes that were taken down. Okay, these were not people's. These were people, not people on vacation. Went, okay, but this is okay. Here it is. Okay, please please be patient and and hear me out. I'm I'm standing up for the people who are vulnerable. Hello, my name is Anita Ring. Most people know me as Jeannie. I'm here today to speak for the people who are part of Lethbridge and are, mo and are most vulnerable. I am someone's daughter, niece, granddaughter. I'm a mother myself. I am an addictions counselor who has fallen back into addiction. I am a friend. I'm a victim of sexual, physical, and mental abuse. I have been to prison, mental wards. I'm a university graduate. I am a former housing coordinator for Home Base in Calgary, which is a branch off the Alex. I'm a survivor and a fighter. Today is a very serious issue which needs to be addressed and talked about and solved. This is an issue, this issue is housing for the homeless, the most vulnerable people in our community, our city. I'm not here to attack anyone. But our most vulnerable people are being attacked. Their homes are being torn down. They do not choose to be out there because of addiction. Addiction is an underlying, is a symptom of an underlying issue. The, uh, yes, you will see drug use out here. Yes, you will. But you will not see any other crimes. These people are building their communities. It is not an encampment just because they don't live in homes that we recognize as communities doesn't mean that this is not a community. This is a community of vulnerable individuals who need our support. We need 
These are the people that we are supposed to help the most. We have systems set up to support them, and these, pro these systems were discouraged to come down to the encampments and feed them or, or give them water. Some of these services were, were given tickets. Individuals who stayed in the encampments were given $600 fines for, for living there. Don't, don't, Thank you. Put, don't put it on the table. For living there. There's one individual in particular. She has received up to $6,800 in fines for living in the encampments. This is a community of Lethbridge. This is not a corporation. Remember this. This is a, this is a city. And then we and we are supposed to embrace all, everyone, especially the most vulnerable. Can we bring this to an end? I can't stress enough how much these people need our help. Do not fail them, please. But Mike. Uh, thank you very much for coming up and speaking, and your words meant a lot. Um, I, I, I don't have a, a lot to, uh, to, to say there, but uh, the one part I would like to say is that uh, a tent is a home. So, um, you know, there's some people that would go up and, uh, and open a tent or feel like they can enter a, a tent. Th that is that person's home, and there are rights. So, you know, there are human rights ar around a tent, and that is part of uh, um, the freedoms in Canada. And uh, shelter is one of those. So um, I do understand uh, um, where the speaker was coming from. And uh, I, do, uh, I, I do feel for, for the people that were in the encampment in that location. But I do want to remind all the public that uh, a tent is a home as well. I, I, I'm sorry, you need to come to the mic if you want to ask a supplementary question. So, so um, just to be clear, saying as you said that shelter is, is an individual's right, um, as a treaty member, I have a list of treaty numbers, treaty members that, I'm getting, that, that were living there. I believe treaty members are allowed to just to live anywhere. From what I understand, that's what Alberta, the Alberta uh, law say. Can we not call that a reserve with the fence around it, like we put around the other reserves, and and make that the city reserve okay. for the for the for the vulnerable? Thank you. Uh, that is a, an interesting question. I know that. Uh, there has been contemplated an urban reserve for, for some time. Um, I haven't uh, been directly involved in a lot of those conversations. I know there's a lot of legalities that are around that um, and for different pieces of land. I know that it has been discussed. Is that a possible solution? I know that there are places across Canada that have looked at those solutions and done them. I know that there are currently some uh, um, areas across Canada that are doing um, um, some test pilots on uh, setting up pads on different areas where then people can set up their tents and uh, uh, take them down and move them after a certain amount of days to another location. But uh, again, we're, we're working and seeing what, what is happening in other communities and uh, we will try and keep the public updated as we move forward. Thank it you. is a very complex issue. Though. Thank you. Next, next question. My name is Francis Schultz. I would like to let, thank Mike for his presentation in that it sounds quite organized about ways to deal with this. But my question is this. You said that the enforcement is done by the police. Someone yesterday had to direct the police to go and tear down people's homes. And I would like to know who is responsible for doing that act. Speak of the mic. Yeah. 
So uh, with, uh, with the actions that uh, happened over in the civic uh, grounds yesterday, that was a, a city corporation decision. So the city of Lethbridge did decide to do that. Um, I know that there's different perspectives on if there was a legal activity, if there wasn't. Um, again, there was a decision made that uh, there was uh, activity that could be harmful to the public or to the people in the encampments in that location, and that is why uh, the direction was uh, pushed uh, or given to uh, LPS to take the action. As brief as you can be. I live uh, directly across the street from the encampment and in the whole time that that has been there, there have been absolutely no incidents that caused me any problems or made me afraid. And, and thank you very much for those comments. Sorry. Yeah. Is that better? Yeah, you got to kiss the mic. Okay. Um, thank you very much for those comments. Um, and there are many different perspectives uh, on this. Again, um, we have received uh, different types of complaints, and uh, we receive them, and uh, we, we work with multiple organizations on them. And uh, that is the decision that was made, um, and uh, it was it, the enforcement was was enacted upon. <laughs> Yeah, of course. I can see this. Um, I'm not going to be as friendly. I sat in here and I listened, and what I kept hearing was committee, 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 until I bloody well lost count. What I want to know is how many units of social housing, how many SRO units, how many places that people can actually go and live have been built in this city. Thank you again for the comments. Um, at this time, I know that uh, the province is supposed to be putting out uh, procurement for um, uh, a 42-bed uh, uh, permanent supportive housing um, area. There was an announcement from the province uh, about a uh, million dollars uh, for 70 extra uh, shelter beds in the city. Um, again, I'm working with the province to understand that more fully on what that means. Um, however, there, the plain and simple answer to the question is not enough. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Barb Phillips, uh, sometimes known on the street as Grandma. Uh, I have been boots on the ground in Lethbridge before, uh, well, I guess the last five years. So my question, Mike, and I applaud you for coming today because this is a very controversial issue in Lethbridge. My, my comment is this, and then the question. The city puts out all sorts of stats. I read how many kilograms, I guess it was tons, of debris. I hate that word because you know why? Debris is not someone's worldly possessions. And I know that in those black garbage bags, which the clean sweep people were loading into the dumpsters, those were people's lives. They probably didn't have a grocery cart to put that bag in. Secondly, you, you put out all sorts of stats about the number of needles, the number of cookers, the number of uh, pipes you find, all fine and dandy. We used to get those stats when we had a supervised consumption site, but we had needles going out, needles coming in, and it was in the high 90%. That's why when I did Queen's Clean Sweep back in the day as a volunteer, if we found eight needles in the downtown core and I knew where every hot spot was, we were doing well, we thought. So your stats, a little funny. So a couple more stats I would like to hear from the city and this is my question. Yeah. Number one, 
How many places did you set up with potable water locations so that the people when it was 36 degrees in August could access water? And number two, how many porta potties did you set up? How many porta potties did you maintain so that people could have some dignity during this whole spring, summer, fall, now we're doing winter. And uh, thank you again. I might not have uh, all the answers to, to your questions there. Uh, we are taking notes and we'll work on that. I do understand uh, where your comments are coming from. Um, so there, there was a pilot project done on the washrooms. Um, last uh, last summer, um, again, uh, I'm hoping that we can make headway um, because we do need more public washrooms in the downtown and around uh, the city. That is something that uh, is is an important uh, uh, item that we have to address. So I, I do agree with that. Um, I'm trying to remember. The other one in statistics, yes, um, statistics can be used uh, in lots of different ways, and uh, so I do understand your, your comments on, on that as well. Um, now, the statistics that are provided, I, I can't remember if there was articles, but I know the information was gathered on those, uh, those areas and was provided to Council, so it is in, in the public record. Uh, on those. Um, I'm not sure uh, the different hot spots around town. I do know that we work with our service providers on that. Um, throughout uh, the summer and the hot, uh, hot season, we do work with all of our service providers to, uh, to try and get water out to everybody and provide different locations. Is there enough? I don't know what enough is, but uh, I know that uh, some people, I've, I've seen uh, different people out there like the Sage Clan, like other uh, other groups uh, out there providing uh, uh, water in golf gardens and around the downtown area so i'm hoping that there is enough water getting out there but uh, again it is something that we are consciously aware of and i'm hoping that uh, the fire hydrant initiative is uh, available for next year as for uh, the warming and cooling centers is uh, Another uh, thing that we just took, took through on policy, and we'll be hearing more about that uh, in the following months here as we approach the cold air, colder time. Um, the basis of the policy is to try and make sure that people can warm up uh, in areas of the city 24-7 uh, in, in the cold snaps or in the cool down in the cold, colder times. Okay. Um, Thank you. Oki Niksukwex Nidani Go Abamaki. My name's Carly Ironshirt. Um, a few comments uh, and questions. I wanted to say that I think the terminology that the city and uh, related um, organizations use needs to be updated. We keep saying the encampment and we keep giving stats and numbers, but that really dehumanizes. Can we continue to dehumanize these people. We, you know, they're an unhoused community and they are part of the community of Lethbridge and often the community talks exclude these people that are, you know, the ones that need help the most. Um, also, uh, sorry, I'm losing track. <laughs> um, you have a question? Yes, I had a question. I just wanted to know what are the steps after you take down an encampment because you have so many steps following to taking down and throwing away people's things. What are the steps after? Because I work at the Friendship Society and this morning we haven't had people sleeping outside of our building in months because this encampment was here, because they had shelter at this location. You're living like, at the house. You're living at the house right now. And so, you know, like, that's a big concern of mine is that these people are now going back to being isolated in places where they might not, you know, someone might not be able to help them. I'm scared that I'm going to show up at the building not at the right time to save someone's life. So I'd like to know what's being done after. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, we will uh, look and uh, try and revise uh, the language that we are using. Um, I, I can uh, say that I will meet with the team and, and look at that. 
As far as uh, steps after encampments, um, again, uh, yesterday we knew that there would be um, disbursement of, uh, of the people living in the encampments. And uh, we did have service providers uh, going out around town trying to help find services for them. Again, I know that there is a lack of shelter space and uh, accommodation for people. Um, so there, again, there isn't uh, a perfect solution to that. Uh, so we do send people out though to, uh, to try and, uh, and uh, find services for uh, the people that were living there. My heart is hurting. And I cry when I pass by the tents. I, I can only imagine how hard it is to find enough materials to make your own tent and your own shelter and put together pallets and drag them around the city to make a place where you can be safe and where you can be secure. And I know you're cold. <clears throat> I brought two sleeping bags to the shell to the um, tents behind here and found two young women who had slept out rough. They did not have tents. They were freezing. Just back I, Just back pardon me. I asked them, this is pardon me if I was too loud, I asked them why they weren't sleeping at the shelter. And they told me, if you go to the shelter, they give you a mat, which is about three quarters inch thick, and no blanket. I was shocked. I've donated blankets to the shelter. We've donated towels to the shelter to be used for the showers. And when the shelter was before Alpha House got there, <clears throat> they would wash the blankets on a daily basis and people would have blankets. The young women told me they didn't have a blanket and if they put their jacket over themselves to keep warm, the next morning it would be stolen. I said, what about, what about showers? They said, if we go into the showers, the latches are broken and someone comes in and peeks in on us. Now this is not a decent shelter. That is terrible. I heard today from... You have to be brief. I'm brief. I heard today from Mike that we have five million dollars. Five million dollars. Why aren't we building shelters? Why can't we use the north side Save on Foods that's been sitting there vacant for five years, doing nothing? It's being heated, otherwise it would freeze. All the insides, would, the guts would go. I talked to city council yeah. and I suggested, why don't we do something about it? So I'd like to know, I mean, these were great ideas that you had, but city council will not pass any of these ideas that you've put forward because basically they don't like them. So how are we gonna make something happen? How are we gonna use the money when we have a city council that is anti what we're trying to do here? Please answer me that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for, for those questions. Uh, so uh, administration is uh, bringing forward a, a policy to try and allow that funding to, uh, to roll out to uh, the different service providers. There are service providers that are um, interested in, in coming to Lethbridge. Uh, again, there are barriers and uh, as administration we are working to try and reduce those barriers. Um, for for the, the housing, so I do agree that uh, the money that is in that capital grant currently um, should be out the door and should be being built. Um, as for different locations within the city, uh, again there are barriers to some. Uh, most sites that, uh, including the one that was uh, mentioned, um, is privately owned and uh, it would need to be purchased and renovated uh, for that. It's not saying that it couldn't happen, but uh, it would have to go through a process to be allowed that, and that would take time. Give your name. Bev Mundell Atherstone. I talked to the mayor and I talked to various six councillors when we had those Saturday uh, meetings at city council, at the um, city hall, and uh, I mentioned the Save on Foods North Side. They said they're responsible for it because the people who are renting it, Save on Foods, uh, walked away from it. So city council is responsible. I was also told that the roof leaks. $5 million would certainly take care of the leaky roof and building little rooms all around it for people to have their own place to be safe. Thank you. 
Um, I, I'm not aware that the city uh, is responsible for that, but I can look into that for sure. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Next Hi, my name is Jess. Um, I, I have three, three points questions. I'll try and be brief. Um, the first one, uh, thinking about the illegal activity is a reason that encampments are taken down. Um, if people don't have anything, they can't buy food, they can't buy shelter, how do you live without doing it? Like, it's like their whole existence is illegal. So this seems like a very odd reason to kick them out, to take away what they do have, rather than to allow them to keep what they do have because it's, it's not much, it, it, it feels absurd. Um, the second one is, so there are, yeah, I heard that $5 million, I also heard that uh, $230,000. I'm hearing this sort of trickle down of social services through committees and service providers locally. That hasn't been working so far. Um, we were crunching the math on it, it would take like $6,000 roughly to get a person off the streets, that includes an allotment for, uh, you know, like damage, rent. That includes food. That includes um, uh, like money to pay off fines. That includes all of this stuff. If you divide five million by that much, um, that's like eight hundred and thirty-three thousand three hundred and thirty-three. Um, but but basically, like, there's there's so many ways we could use this money to help people right now whose lives are in danger right now, who are experiencing human rights violations right now, because under the UN, it's actually a state violation of the human rights of the individual, like homelessness is. So the city is passing these bylaws so that they're able to remove people from encampments based on these bylaws and based on this illegal activity. And it's just not a compassionate way to deal with it. Point, so yeah, I want to know. You're going to jail for that, arresting people. Yeah, they're, they're arresting people, they're giving them fines. So I want to know why we are making these situations worse for people through, through that. Like, this, this isn't the solution. Yeah, I, I'm not sure what my question is, but if you could respond to that, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you. I, I do want to thank everybody uh, for coming up and asking these questions. They're, they're, uh, they're questions we struggle with all, all the time, and uh, there's no easy answer. Again, it is complex. Um, I wish it was as easy as, uh, as just doing as you said. Um, it, it, it isn't that, that easy, and there are other complexities that come into effect. But um, yeah, the system isn't working, and it does need change. And I believe uh, all levels of government are realizing that with what is happening across the country. Um, does there have to be change? Yes. And uh, part of that change is about, I know everybody doesn't like the name of a committee or an advisory group, but it is having those interactions, having people with lived experience on those too, and uh, getting the different perspectives. So there is no easy solution, um, but uh, all I can say is I will continue trying to work on it and trying to change policy to, to help people out. Um, but uh, I, I understand your points and the perspective you bring to this. Thank you. Could, could you please speak to the uh, I'm sorry, yeah, sir, sir, we, we, have, we have several other questions okay. that sorry. I'd like to let somebody else speak. Sorry. All right. The person Which beyond Ken there, oh, on the mic. Okay. We're not going to get everybody in, but be brief as you can. Mike McKeg, uh, I've got 100 questions, so I'll have to hurry. But I spent 45 years in law enforcement. Since I retired, I've been with Sage Clan. I've been uh, with the previous speaker handed out water all summer and that. Uh, I think my, my one important question is this. When you hired those young people to work as the cleanup people. And I've been watching at the, the encampment every time that the police have gone in there and started kicking. And I've seen them uh, tell people, uh, you've got to leave. And as the people leave carrying whatever they can. And then the cleanup people come in and they pick up those black bags. People call those garbage bags. There's no garbage in them at that encampment. Those bags are full of clothes 
and possessions and people's. Uh, Mike, do you have a question? Yeah, my question is, what has the city done with all that? Why has the city just thrown all those clothes away? Every day we're being asked to hand stuff in. My wife picks clothes up in the park near our house, washes them and takes them down to streets alive. What does the city do? I watch. The city takes it and throws it in the garbage. Okay, thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so to, to, to be brief on that, I, I don't have a simple answer for that. Um, and uh, yes, uh, the, the cleanups, they, they do go into the garbage. And uh, there are other uh, clothing and necessities needed. So um, I, I don't have a, a simple answer for that one. Okay, we have one more time for one more quick question and a quick answer because we, we do need to honor the time. Hey, Lori, where are you the next? Yeah, I've been moving forward. You've been moved forward. My name is Lori Schultz and Mike, thank you very much for your presentation today. And uh, thank you everyone for your questions. I have one question, kind of two. Um, the one that I really want, would like to have some information is the uh, jurisdiction of the provincial government is pretty clear and I want to know if they are stepping up and fulfilling their jurisdictional responsibilities with respect to the city of Lethbridge and their requests. Um, the second, and I don't know that you'll have time, is if you are finding people are... Question. Okay, I've been cut off. Yep, thank you. Uh, that, that is a very difficult question to answer very in, in a brief amount of time. Um, we continue to work with uh, uh, provincial uh, administration on some of this. Uh, there are constant changes at the political, political level that do uh, cause uh, road bumps uh, in the way. Uh, again, a thing I constantly hear is uh, about our, our zoning and our land use and how do we change that to be enable places to come in and open and uh, through the public hearing process and, and, and all of that. So again, as administration, we are trying to make that easier to uh, allow the provincial and federal government to allow their funds to f flow more freely into the city.